I hate to say goodbye. Let's make it a, um, a so see first, you later. Go before ahead. Before we say goodbye. Huh? Before we say goodbye, I want to use this opportunity to say big thank you to you for all you've done from the beginning of this class to the end. And I will thank you for giving me confidence. I must tell you the truth. <laughs> I was so scared in the beginning, but the way you undo the class, you let me know that I can do it. And I thank God that I, I try my best <laughs> with God help and with your help. <laughs> Oh, I'm happy I, to yes. hear that. I'm happy. I'm, to so, yes. I'm so I happy. Thank you for always asking of my family, asking of my children, asking about them. Michelle, Miko, you always want to know how they are doing. And sometimes maybe if I don't log in on time, you always understand my situation that maybe because of family issue or something like that. It's not all professor that always understand that way. But thank you for always working with me. And thank mm -hmm. you for always being there for me. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very well. You're very, very welcome, Beatrice. And um, record. Okay. You got it, Professor? Okay, I'll check in a minute. Thank you. Okay, one more, one more minute. I already sent mine. Huh? I already sent mine. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Well, oh, that's great. That's great. So let me just take, make sure I got them. So let's see here. <clears throat> Share for a second. And then we go over here. Um, Sam, what I didn't get yours. Sam, can you send yours again, Sam? What? Yeah, I sent I sent it on email. It didn't. It didn't come. Could you send it again? Sure. It says sent here. Okay, maybe it's just my, my machine. All right, well, let's, uh, let's quickly go over it then. I'm sure it'll come. So let's go back here. Okay, the first one, um, we'll take turns. Um, Samowit, proteins play a crucial role in all biological processes. Mm -hmm. Beatrice, a protein is an amino acid polymer with more than 50 amino acids. True. True. <laughs> uh, number three, uh, Samowit, vasopressin causes uterine contractions and stimulates lactation of mammary glands when nursing a baby. False. False. What should it be? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. Good. Beatrice. <laughs> Beatrice, we just went over that. Beatrice, the bond between two amino acids is called a peptide bond or peptide linkage. True. True. And then Samerwit, arrow B in the diagram below is pointing to an alpha carbon. True. True. Good, 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 good. Any question? Did you miss one, Beatrice? Yes. <laughs> did, you get, did you get them all right, Samerwit? Yeah. Okay. So you got confused again. Well, you'll have a chance to study that. But remember when I said vasopressin, think of pressing on, uh, on a blood vessel and that restricts 
the flow of the blood and then restricts the urine. Or think of a way to remember, okay? And now, again, on the, um, going back, let me, let, me, let me share the screen again. Uh, let's see, where were we here? So um, this, this guy right here is gonna be, uh, is, the, is the last page of the exam. It's a matching. And you're going to have to match A, B, C, and D. Okay, mm -hmm. so A, A is amino, B is alpha carbon, C is carboxyl, carboxylate group, and R is the side chain. Okay, so that'll be the lab, that's the matching for the exam. All right, let me see what else I have here. Good. All right, now what I'm going to do is go to slide. Can both of you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, let me go to slide 30. So we're gonna finish the chapter and then recap the course. Okay, so let's start again with protein functions. There's eight of them. Enzyme function, which means it acts as a catalyst, right? Structural function, it's a building material. Proteins are used for storage. They have a protective function, number four. They have a regulatory function. They control processes. They're involved in nerve impulse transmission. They're involved in muscle movement and they're involved in transport, transporting things. So I underline the first letter in each of these. The reason I did that is because one way to, to try to memorize them is make a sentence that begins with each of these letters, like every ship should and whatever, and make up a sentence, P-R-N-M-T, and then, that's the way to remember. So you need to know those eight, eight functions of proteins, which is amazing. And the type of question would be, you know, in a multiple choice, which of the following are the functions of a protein? So you need to know what they are. You follow that? Yeah. All right. And again, that goes without saying. They, they're crucial, proteins are crucial. All right, and um, as you go through the notes this time, you know, make a list of all the terms that are, anytime you come across a term in the notes, make, it, make a note of it, because this exam is gonna be more like a biology exam, really, knowing what different things are and what they do. And I'm also gonna give you a list at the end, you'll see, I, I made a list for you too, to help you. Okay, so let's review again. The first one is easy, enzyme, it's a catalyst. So they speed up living, speed up reactions in living organisms. And without them, biological reactions would go too slowly to support life. So the enzyme function, enzymes are made of proteins. Then we talked about the building material. And actually when I mentioned, I, I took it out, but when I mentioned um, cellulose, that's a plant material, that's not protein. Cellulose is not a protein, but that's what makes up the plant cell wall. But, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, what are proteins used to build? And they're used to build the skeleton. So the skeleton is composed of protein and of course, things like calcium, right? And remember, if you take vitamin D, that helps the absorption of calcium into the bones. So that's why vitamin D is important. So skeleton, and then there, there are two um, proteins I'd like you to know what they do or what they are. Collagen is a fiber-like protein responsible for the mechanical strength of skin and bone. And keratin is related to your hair. It's a chief constituent of hair, also skin and fingernails. Let's see, so again, try to think of a way to link collagen with the strength of, of skin and bone and keratin, think of a way to um, link that to the hair and fingernails. Um, I think sometimes in a shampoo, they mention that they mention this, this thing takes, has keratin. Have you ever seen that on a shampoo bottle? Maybe yeah. not, maybe not. Hey, have you seen it? Yeah. I've yeah. Seen. So that shampoo, think of shampoo hair, okay? All right. Then we have the storage function. Proteins can be used to store things. What do they store? Well, here's two examples. By the way, I put an accent mark just for me to pronounce it. It's O-valbumin, O-valbumin is a stored form of amino acids that is used by embryos developing in a bird egg. So ovalbumin, and then casein, very important, is a milk protein. 
it's a stored form of protein when it nourishes humans, especially babies and, and animals. And uh, so casein, uh, that's a key, key aspect of milk is the protein. There's other things in, in milk. There's water, there's, um, you know, there's um, lactose, which is a milk sugar. And um, when milk sours, what happens? The lactose becomes a lactic acid and, it, and it's, it doesn't taste good. So lactose is more the sweet, the normal taste of milk. And some people are intolerant. They can't take lactose. So they have to have a milk without the lactose. Because if they take lactose, they get a lot of stomach problems, diarrhea and stomach upset. They can't digest it. Okay, so ovalbumin, casein are storage functions of protein, very important. Then ferritin is another storage protein. And remember the Fe, which element is Fe, Sam Witt? Iron. Iron, remember it comes from the ferrous. So that, that will be a clue. When you see ferritin, it has to do with iron. So it's a way to store iron. It attaches, this protein attaches to the iron ions. And remember the two iron ions, Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, Remember, they're transition metals, and it forms a storage complex in humans and animals. Okay, now, you don't want to have too much iron, because that could be dangerous, but it's very unlikely you, you'd ever get too much iron, unless you took it as a supplement. Then, then you could take too much. And the thing is, as you take it, it gets stored. So the more and more you take it, the more and more it gets stored. Whereas vitamin C is water-soluble, because some people advocate large amounts of vitamin C to protect against the, against the cold and whatever. If you take too much vitamin C, no problem. It just comes out in the urine. And, and, and the joke is that you just have expensive urine <laughs> because the excess vitamin just goes, vitamin C goes right through the urine. Anyway, and, and, and it may have a, a good effect. I, I take some, I take vitamin C, you know, as a supplement. I don't take huge amounts, but I do take vitamin C. Protective function. Oh, I love these antibodies. Oh, antibodies, you make my day antibodies. They fight the viruses and the bacteria, any foreign substances in the blood or in the tissues of the body. And right now, if you've been vaccinated like I have, you have an army of antibodies inside you. By the way, let's pray for the end, end of this pandemic. Now it's starting up again. You know, it's just, I'm so tired of it. I'm sure you are too. Now the Delta variant was a mutation and now they got this Delta variant and some people don't want to get vaccinated and unfortunately they're getting it now because they're not vaccinated. So of course the other angle is we got to come up with a medicine. They're, they're working on an antiviral tablet, a tablet you could take that, that would kill the virus if you get it. So that's, that's another avenue, but right now it's not ready. So all we have is the vaccine and social distancing. And I think we're going to have, have to start wearing masks, masks again. They're, they're saying now that um, even if you're vaccinated, you could carry the virus and it could go, you could transport it to somebody else. So probably in Montgomery County, we're going to, I know the, for the, for the high schools and elementary schools, you're going to have to wear a mask in Montgomery County. Now, I don't know about the universities, so we haven't heard anything, but they'll, they'll let us know. There will be protocols in place this, this semester. We're still in transition. So we just have to deal with it try to stay safe. But antibodies are great. And by the way, the immune system is really, really cool. It's really amazing. There's all kinds of things involved in fighting these foreign substances in the body. It does a great job. It really does do a great job. Okay, another protective function would be blood clotting. So thrombin, protein, and fibrinogen are involved in clotting. And we need these. If not, otherwise, uh, the bleeding would never stop. All right. Then there's a regulatory function, which controls processes. So growth hormone controls great growth, regulates growth. It's a huge breakthrough. And I believe we can synthesize growth hormone in the lab. So if, if a child is not growing properly, we can, we can give them growth hormone. And uh, obviously, if they don't have growth hormone, they're going to be, and, 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 and uh, if they have a shortage, for whatever reason, then, then they're, they're not going to grow very tall, okay? So this is a big advance in medicine. And then thyrotropin is another one. It stimulates that, horm that protein hormone, stimulates the, the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland regulates the metabolism of the body. Okay. 
the nerve pulse in, impulse transmission. So the proteins serve as receptors, okay, of small molecules that pass between the synapses. In this way, they they're able to transmit the nerve impulses from one nerve to another. Now, let me, I'm going to show you something. You don't have to know, you don't have to know um, anything on this slide. This is only an extra, just to help you to give you a more sense of what, what we're talking about. So here's a synapse. It's a space between two nerves. There's a little neurotransmitter that's released, and these receptors catch, catch the neurotransmitters. And then the message continues through, you know, until it gets to the brain. So the receptors are protein. That, that's, all, that's all we want to say. These, pro, these receptors are made of protein. By the way, do either of you remember the, the name of the neurotransmitters? Is this, what is it? They call us uh, receptors? No, no, I'm talking about these little chemicals that are released. Well, you, you'll study it in courses, but there's a little, little chemicals that are released, which go through this little space, the synapse, and then they're absorbed by the receptors. So you don't need to know any of this, just that proteins make up the receptors. And in the same way, rhodopsin is a protein found in the rod cells of the retina of the eye, which function in the vision process. Now, again, you don't need to know anything on this slide. This is just for, to give you a little, a little uh, idea of what they look like. Here's the retina. Here's, the, here's your front of the eye. Okay, the light comes in here. The back of the eye, as you know, as you may know, is called the retina. We have nerves coming out of there. So what they did is they took this little space here and they blew it up here and it looks like this. These are called the cone cells. You see, they, they look like a cone, the red ones and the blue. They look like a cone. Those are called cone cells. And the rods are the straight, you know, the straight rods. Those are called the rods. And those are used in transmission of the message. That is when you, you know, what you see gets transmitted to the brain and their brain interprets it, okay? So, um, but you need these rods and cones and the rods are made of, of a protein called rhodopsin, okay? So that's what, I, that's what I want you to know. You don't need to know either of these diagrams, just try to help you to place exactly what it's doing. And you'll be studying this in your other courses if you haven't studied already, the function of the eye and the function of the nerves and so on but there are proteins involved there, okay? So rhodopsin, rod cells, helps with vision, okay? And then we have muscle movement. So the proteins are actin and myosin. They're long filament or long fiber proteins that slide along each other during muscle contraction. And if you ever take a physiology course, you'll, you'll study that more. Transport function. So many small molecules are transported through the body only after binding to proteins. So fatty acids, which make up fats, are carried between the fat tissue and other tissues or organs by the serum albumin. So serum albumin is a blood protein that carries fatty acids, okay? Fatty acids are important in the, in the body for certain, making up certain things. And they also can be used for energy. Um, let me just close the window. I have a, uh, I have a leaf blower. There's a leaf blower making a lot of noise. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is very, very important. Hemoglobin. Oh my God, is hemoglobin important? And it carries, carries oxygen from the lungs to the other body tissues. Okay. So, that's very important. Hemoglobin is in the blood. And as a matter of fact, you probably know this hemoglobin has iron in there. And that gives it the red color, actually. The red color of blood is really because of the iron in there. And anyway, uh, hemoglobin carries oxygen. So again, think of, think of a way to, to remember that. And then we have transferrin. Again, we have the Fe. Uh, which metal is Fe, Beatrice? Do you remember? So you're muted. Iron. iron. Okay. So it's going to be in trans, you can think of transportation. It's a transportation of iron. So the other, the other time, we, the other thing we mentioned had to do with storage. This has to do with carrying iron in the blood plasma. And remember what the blood plasma is? It's the, it's the colorless liquid part of the blood, you know, the watery part of the blood. Okay. And by the way, you know, um, 
people that have had um, COVID early on, one of the things they were doing, they were donating their plasma because it had antibodies in it. And then they were giving those antibodies to patients with COVID to help fight it. I haven't heard too much about this anymore, um, but, but the antibodies were in the blood plasma. Anyway, transferrin carries iron in the blood plasma. All right, so in summary, the eight functions, enzyme function, building material structural function, storage function, protective, regulatory, nerve impulse, muscle movement, and transport. So those are the eight functions of proteins. And you can see proteins are very, very, very important. By the way, you know, let's step back and again, just be amazed. Remember we said that, am that amino acids join together in these long chains, right? To make these proteins, proteins are different kinds of proteins as, as we've just seen. Well, how did, I, how, do, how did all those things get organized and put together? Did it happen by chance? Come on, I mean, it's amazing how everything is so organized and intricate. Each protein is a little different, has different amino acids, different numbers of amino acids, and then they take on these important functions. So it's, very, it's a very cool thing, if, and, and I don't want you to miss that. You gotta always be amazed at what's going on in, in humans and other living, other living um, beings. Okay, now here's a little study sheet I made for you. So what I want you to do is know the eight functions in each of these terms. So the collagen and keratin and so on, all those terms, you need to know what they mean. And again, it's, it's gonna be multiple choice or true and false. So you just need to know what those proteins do, what, what the function of each of those proteins is. For example, I act in a myosin or in the muscle, muscle movement. Okay. Now, this is just a little extra thing. This will not be on the exam, but I just want to emphasize something because most people don't, don't know this. These are called steroid hormones. And notice just what we studied. They had this cycloalkanes, don't they? One, two, three, four, five, six. Cyclohexane, cyclopentane. You got some double bonds in there. You have some functional groups hanging off there. These are called steroids. These are steroid hormones. Now, the point that I really want you to know, just for life in general and for your careers, hormones are just messengers in the body that flow through the blood. They're, 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 they're released and they flow to a target organ. And by the way, each target organ has a receptor to receive that message. And then once it receives it, it brings about the effect, whatever effect it's going to be. Now, for example, progesterone is, is a hormone involved in pregnancy, okay? But anyway, people think when, when you say hormones, they, as I said last time, they're only th they, they think you're talking about men's hormones and women's hormones, or, which are basically steroid hormones. Well, there's another class of hormones, proteins. And as you know, the proteins are made up of these amino acids. Okay, so there's two kinds of hormones, a steroid hormone, and a protein hormone. And they both do the same type of work. They carry a message through the blood to the target organ, all right? So uh, be, I mean, uh, Samarwit, what's a hormone? What's, what's a hormone? What's a, uh, it's a message. It's a messenger. And actually mm -hmm. one, th one thing that, that might be on the exam is a true and false. What if I said all hormones are steroid hormones? Is that true or false, Beatrice? False. It's false, because you, you got protein hormones too. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my favorite, um, you know, in graduate school, I studied uh, biochemistry and physiology. And my favorite is uh, this thing of the endocrine system. The, um, the, the, uh, it's called endocrinology. And it's basically studying these little messengers, which are released in very, very small amounts, go through the blood, and they have powerful effects and long lasting effects. You know, for example, let's say you get upset, a dog is running after you and you, you make it home and you're kind of upset and it lasts for a while, you know, adrenaline's released. It takes you a while to calm down. It might take a few hours. So 
the endocrine system is long lasting. And again, this is not gonna be an exam, but the endocrine system is long lasting, whereas the nervous system is a split second. You, you, you accidentally put your finger on a hot, hot pan and you immediately move it away. And if you didn't burn yourself, that's it, it's over. Anyway, the endocrine system is more long lasting and it's, but it's quite amazing the endocrine system, how, how the whole thing operates. And so is the nervous system, as a matter of fact. Okay, so that's a little extra for you, but just remember, two classes. I have a question. Please. Okay, the steroid, the steroid, the steroid hormones, all this, only six of them are steroid? No, 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 no. These are just examples, examples. There's many okay. more, there's many more. But notice mm -hmm. that they all have the ring. They're all cycloalkanes, you see that? The rings are all, they have many rings. Yeah, there, 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 are, there are many more. Um, for example, I didn't put adrenaline in here. Adrenaline is a steroid hormone. There's many other. This, these are just examples, but that's a good question. Thank you. I should have pointed that out. Just wanted to give you some examples of what they look like and how they're different from an amino acid. Good question, though. Very good question. Yeah, there are many more. There are many more um, steroids. And as long as you ask that question, I'd love to talk about this. So um, cholesterol looks like one, looks like this. And I told you this before that um, it's in the skin. And when your skin is exposed to sunshine, the cholesterol gets converted to vitamin D. So vitamin D has a similar structure. It has some of these, these rings. And then vitamin D, of course, is so important for the absorption of calcium in, into the body and into, into the bones. If you don't have vitamin D, you get rickets. You get very, very brittle bones. They break easily. But it's interesting because cholesterol looks like something like this. Not exactly, but it looks like the steroid hormone. It's not a steroid. Cholesterol is not a steroid hormone, but it looks like it. You know, it's similar with, the, with all these different rings. Okay. All right, this is important to remember. Let me just, uh, okay. Let me just stop here. Here's an amino acid. Here's a second amino acid. I want you to know how they join. I want you to know how they join. First of all, that is the carboxyl group right here, the C double bond O minus. That's the amino group. This is where they join. And what do you end up with? The N joins that C. It retains one H, and you could say kind of, it kind of ejects two H's and an O, which form water. This N connects with the alpha car, with the, well, excuse me, with this carbon here, not the alpha carbon, but so it forms, see how the N goes there. So if I said to you, um, which of these is the peptide bond, you'd have to be able to tell me that it's this one. Okay, so I want you to be able to know that, that when these two bind, this N connects with that C. And that's where it is. This is this is not the peptide. That's not the peptide. That's not the peptide. None of these bonds. It's this one right here. So I'd like you to know that. Okay, is that clear? And I also mm -hmm. like you to know that this is called the carboxyl group. This is called the amino group. And remember, this is going to be the N terminal. Each amino acid has an N terminal, which we always put on the left side, and an O and a C terminal. The C is part of the carboxyl. It's always on the right. So this has the N terminal, and this has a the C terminal. And just a picture of, what, of what's happening here, the two amino acids are joining and this is our, our peptide bond, as you know, or peptide linkage, either way. So notice you can call it peptide linkage or you can call it peptide bond. And that's how the amino acids bind to each other and you get these long chains. And, you know, they, it's all organized to form different proteins with, which have different functions. All right, now what we're gonna do is look at two things. The shape, there are two shapes possible for proteins. And then we're gonna classify proteins as simple or conjugated. Okay, so there's two shapes that a protein can come in. The first shape is like a fiber, fibrous, okay? So it's a rod, long rod-like shaped or string-like molecules. They're not soluble in water and they make up the connective tissue, elective, el el elastic tissue in the body. Connective tissue would be like ligaments, 
elastic tissue, cartilage, and other things, hair and skin are made up of fibrous proteins. And of course, we've looked at some of these, collagen, elastin. Well, we haven't looked at elastin, but we looked at collagen and keratin, and that's what it looks like. So that's one shape of a protein. It's made up of these fibers. So if I gave you a picture, what type of protein is that? Fibrous, right? The other shape is, is, like, is like a glob, a globule, <laughs> a glob. It's like a glob. That's fibrous protein. So, and then the glob, it looks like a glob. These, by the way, are transport proteins, things like hemoglobin and, and transferrin. Their shape is, is like that. It's just like a glob. It's like a glob or a blob, you know, it's a spherical thing. This is more like a fiber. And so things like hemoglobin and transferrin, they look, they have that shape. A globule, it's called globular shape, like a globe. You know, you think of a globe as, as spherical, you know, is a, a sphere, you know. So those are the two shapes that proteins come in. And as everything in, in, in biology, the shape helps it perform its function. Okay, the shape helps it perform its function. That's why it has that shape. Everything's organized perfectly. So that's a globular protein. So fibrous globular. Okay, then we can talk about simple or conjugated. And we have this fancy word here, conjugated. We'll get to that. Simple protein is, is a piece of cake. That's what we've been looking at. It's just amino acids attached to each other. That's a simple protein. Nothing else but amino acids. Conjugated have something, something else attached to the amino acids. Okay, it can be organic, organic or inorganic components. Remember inorganic does not contain carbon. Organic contains carbon. Basically in conjugated, something is attached to the amino acid. That's a conjugated protein. Now, let's look at this word. Conjugate in Latin means to join. And one of the words we use in English is conjugal. Have you ever heard of that word conjugal? Conjugal refers to marriage. Why? Because the man and wife are joined together. Okay, so conjugal refers to marriage. Conjugate means to join. So here we're basically saying something is attached or joined to the amino acid, so that's why it's called conjugated. Now, the thing that is attached, they, they also give a fancy name. They call it a prosthetic group. So it's the non-amino acid that is attached to the protein. That's something is called the prosthetic group. And what does prosthesis mean? You've heard of prosthesis, haven't you? What does that mean, uh, Beatrice? You're, you're muted. Non-amino acid. Say it. Non-amino acid. You say right. prosthetic right. group. But what I'm saying is, have you ever heard of the word prosthesis for a patient? If a person has a prosthesis, okay. Have you heard of it, uh, Sam Witt? Yeah, I mean. The fake one. No. Yes, exactly. It's an artificial limb. It's called a prosthesis. And we've gotten really good at this, thanks, thanks be to God that soldiers that come back um, from war and they maybe they got injured by a blast and they, and they lose their legs or they lose an arm. So we have these artificial limbs now, especially in the legs, they're really good. You can, they can, you can run on them and everything. It's a, doing a, it's a wonderful service to those patients. So prosthesis is something that's attached to the body, artificial. So that's where, the, that's where this word prosthetic means. It's something attached to the protein. It's a non-amino acid. This only has amino acids. Simple is, is what we've been looking at. Simple, just one amino acid attached to another, peptide bonds in between. Here you've got the prosthetic group attached to an amino acid. So it's called conjugated. Now this slide um, just gives you the examples of prosthetic groups. You don't need to know anything on this chart. You just need to know what a prosthetic group is. It's something that attaches. So let's, let's just look at some examples. If a nucle nucleic acid, DNA and RNA attaches to the amino acid, it's called the nucleoprotein. 
or if lipids attach to a protein, it's a lipoprotein. If carbohydrates attach to the protein, it's glycoprotein. Phosphate groups, phosphoproteins. Heme, hemoproteins. Iron, metalloproteins. And same thing for zinc. An example of the nuclear protein would be a virus. In fact, the antibody, I believe, I mean, the vaccine that's used for COVID is a messenger RNA that they put in there. And, and I guess it's like the COVID. And so the body makes antibodies against it. And these are some other examples of um, proteins that have a prosthetic group that are conjugated. So you only need to know that a prosthetic group is something attached to an amino acid. And that particular type of protein is called a conjugated protein if something is attached to it. And the thing attached, again, is the prosthetic group. So conjugated and prosthetic. Okay, so what did we just look at? We looked at the shape. What are the two shapes, Beatrice, that proteins can be in? Fibrous or globular? Globular, okay. How would you describe glo globular? Like a globe. Like a globe, okay. And then we have... Uh, Simple versus conjugated. Um, Sam Wood, what's the difference between a simple protein and a conjugated protein? Uh, I don't know, Professor. Yeah, the simple protein just has amino acids attached to each other. The conjugated protein has something attached to it to the amino acid. What's, what's the something called that's attached? Do you remember? Amino? Prosthetic, prosthetic, prosthesis. Well, prosthetic group, like, like prosthesis. Okay. So conjugated has something attached to it. And the thing attached to it is called the prosthesis, prosthetic group, like prosthesis, which is an artificial limb, which attaches to the body. Okay, we're gonna look now at, at, at what is called the primary structure of a protein, which is easy. And just so you know, there's also a secondary structure, a tertiary structure and a quaternary structure. We're not gonna look at those. <laughs> those are complicated. We're not gonna look at those. We're just gonna look at one. We're just gonna look at one. And this is the primary structure, very easy. Primary structure is just the linear sequence of the amino acids. Or in other words, it's the order in which the amino acids are joined together in a protein chain. For example, here, this, this as we'll see, is, is insulin. Insulin has two, you could say, has a beta, well, they call it a beta chain. It has two chains. And so one they call alpha, one they call beta. And these amino acids are in a certain order. And if they're not in that order, then the insulin is not going to work. They have to be in this order. That's called, the, that's called the primary protein structure is the sequence, the order that the amino acids are in. And by the way, just, just a little the extra thing here. Um, you've got a disulfide bond. Remember that disulfide? Right one there and there's one there. So that's what insulin looks like. But the important thing is, if I said to you, what's the pr primary structure of a protein? It's the sequence, the linear sequence of amino acids, the order in which they are joined. You can't change them. You can't mix them up. Or otherwise, it's not the protein won't 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 work. It won't be. So, if you have a variation in the primary structure, that can have big big differences in the function of the protein. Well, here's insulin, right there. So, what I'm showing you here is insulin. Remember, insulin. If you recall from a previous slide, it has 51 amino acids. It is more than uh, it has more than 50, so we call it a protein, it's insulin. Do either of you know what insulin does in the body? It's a protein hormone. Do you know what it does? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's reduce the strength of a, is it diabetes or something like yeah, that? Yeah, if, if you're good, that's good. If you're deficient on insulin, then you have, and usually it's something you're born with, 
It's not something that you get. It's just a genetic defect, but it's a serious, serious one. You can die from it without treatment. But um, type one diabetes, you have a shortage of insulin, not enough insulin is produced. What does insulin do? Well, what happens if you have a shortage of insulin? What happens in the, what do you notice in the blood? A lot of glucose. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. You have an excess amount of glucose and uh, that can cause a lot of problems. That can damage your eyes, it can damage your kidney, it can damage different parts. Sometimes people have to have a limb amputated because it gets damaged. So it's very important to keep the glucose level at the proper level. So what insulin does is insulin basically causes the glucose to be stored inside a cell or inside your muscles, okay? And um, there's another hormone that causes the glucose to be released into the bloodstream, just the opposite, but we're not gonna worry about that at this point. So insulin is very important. And again, I, I believe insulin now can be synthesized in the laboratory. And uh, for type one diabetes, it's, uh, it's something uh, you really have to monitor very closely. They're getting better now. Um, I think they have things that you can keep attached to your arm and let you know if the glucose level is okay. Because a diabetic person, diabetes, they don't wanna have too low blood sugar, otherwise they're gonna pass out. So in the old days, what they would do is they'd have like a candy bar in their car, car glove compartment. So if they, get, if they start feeling faint, they'll eat the candy bar. But the idea is to try to keep the insulin level at the proper, I mean, the glucose level at the proper level in the blood. Okay, so that's just a little side story. But the point is that uh, primary structure is the order in which the amino acids are, are put together. And if they're not in that order, then you can have big changes in, in whether or not the protein is going to work. It has to be in that order. So again, you can see the amazing um, complexity and harmony in nature. Holy smokes, it's so complicated and everything's has to be in a certain way for things to work. Amazing, that's amazing. Okay, that's insulin. Okay, um, don't need to know this chart. I just wanna give you some examples. Uh, some proteins whose sequence of amino acids is known and it tells you how many, how many amino acids, forget about this word residue. Basically it's a number of amino acids, okay? So insulin has 51, hemoglobin has those two, has two chains. One is 141 amino acids, another is 146. Human growth hormone, 191. Here's one, a thousand amino acids linked together and, and they know the sequence of each amino acid. So again, you don't need to know this chart. This is some examples of long chains of amino acids in which the sequence or the order is known. So again, the primary, what's the primary structure, Samuel of a protein? What's the primary structure? Um, Beatrice, can you help her? What's the primary structure? Sequence, I forget. Okay, sequence. It's, the, it's the order, it's the sequence or order in which the amino acids are aligned. You see that? Okay. That's called the, the primary protein structure. It's the linear sequence, the order in which they are joined together. And they have to, they have to be in a specific order, have to be in this order. So the primary structure is very important. Okay. All right, two more topics um, that we want to look at here in this chapter. Some more vocabulary. And remember, um, this is the language, really now it's the language of biochemistry we're talking about here. We're, look at, we're going to look at something called hydrolyze. It's a verb. So we're going to look at conditions that can cause proteins to hydrolyze or become denatured. And I put a little note here, you need to know the difference between hydrolysis and denaturization. So let's, let's look at each of these. Okay, hydrolysis, hydro, any idea what hydro refers to? Water. Water, exactly. And it's, it's using water, it lysis means to break apart something. To break apart something, lysis. 
And these are both from the Greek. Lysis is to break apart something. So protein hydrolysis is going to be the heating of a peptide or protein. Remember, peptide is just less than 50 amino acids. Protein's more than, it really should be polypeptide, but that's okay. It's, just, it's the same idea. Uh, heating of a peptide or protein in the presence of an acid or a base, causing it to break into smaller peptides or amino acids. And that, that of course, is what happens in digestion. When you eat a piece of meat or fish, you swallow it, it gets into the stomach, you've got body temperature, which is, what's body temperature, by the way? What, what number? 36. 36 Celsius, right. And that's, that's a high temperature. And then you have, in the stomach, you have water, you have acid, you have uh, low concentrations of hydrochloric acid, and that causes the protein to break apart into its amino acids. So it separates the amino acids. So hydrolysis is breaking up with water. There are some enzymes involved there. Um, let me just see. Yeah, so the protein, which is a long chain of amino acids, eventually gets broken down into individual amino acids. This H plus just means an acid. This OH minus means a base. Remember what a ba acid has a pH less than seven pH of water is seven, and a base has a pH greater than seven. So in an acid or a base with water in a high temperature, you break down the amino acid. That's called hydrolysis. Water, with water, you break something apart. Now, if a person is not able to digest, I mentioned this, uh, I think maybe last week, but if a person is not able to digest for whatever reason, we can use total parental nutrition, which is the nutrients are in their component forms, amino acid, fatty acids, glucose, can be, as Beatrice mentioned, can be given through a vein intravenously. They can be given all the nutri nutrients they need. Obviously, it's not the ideal way to go, but it will, you know, if, if you can't digest things, and you need to have a way to get those nutrients. Now, a feeding tube is different because in a feeding tube, it could be you're swallowing or something's wrong with the throat or the swallowing. And so then you can put the food right into the stomach where it's digested. Okay. So that's hydrolysis. Now, denaturization. Denatur denaturation. Uh, D means, you know, uh, basically, uh, it's, make, it's sort of um, breaking its nature denature it's breaking the nature process by which a proton protein protein loses its characteristic characteristic native or original structure and it loses its nature basically it no longer can function so denature denaturation means losing its nature can't function anymore Hydrolysis is breaking it up into amino acids. The native state would be its natural, its natural shape. And uh, when a protein is exposed to certain physical or chemical conditions such as heat, and I'll give some other examples of what it can be exposed to, it leads to a loss of biological activity. And then when it changes its shape, it's no longer soluble and it rises to the surface of the water and it's called a precipitate. For example, here's an example of denaturation. Cooking an egg. What does an egg look like, Beatrice, when you when you if you crack an egg, what does it look like when you put it into the pan at first? It looks like water. It looks like water and has a little you can see the yolk there. It has yolk, yellow yolk inside. And what happens, um, Sam when you heat it, what happens to the egg? It loses the color and the shape. Well, all of a sudden it becomes a white, white, a white substance. So in, the, in that case, it's, it's, called, it's, it's actually denatured now. Of course, it's a good food. But in this process is not reversible. Once you, once you denature it, you can't get, get it back to the original state. And so when you denature a protein, it loses its biological activity. It no longer functions. And you can't bring it back to function. It loses 
denaturation. It loses its nature. We can't, can't function anymore. And I would like you to know some of the things that cause it to be denatured. Oh, wait a second, before I get to that. So this is just an illustration. You don't need to know this illustration. It's just saying the same thing again, that when the protein, let's say the protein had this shape, and then it gets de de denatured and it can't function anymore. And then it floats to the surface. It becomes a precipitate. So you don't need to know this chart. I'm just trying to sort of give you an idea how the shape has changed and then it can't function anymore. It's denatured, can't function anymore. for your information only. Now, this is what I'd like you to know. The things that can denature a protein that can cause it no, no longer to function, heat or ultraviolet light, and of course in cooking, organic solvents like ethanol, other miscible with water, strong acids or bases, can denature detergents. You should know that detergents can denature and even heavy metals. These are, on the periodic chart, these are big, big atoms. They're big atoms. And so we call them heavy metal because they're very large. What is HG? Do you remember what that is? Mercury. Mercury. It comes from the hydrogyrum from the, from the Latin. What is AG, Beatrice? Silver. Silver. Argentina. Think of Argentina. Argentina is the silver, silver republic. And then um, what about PB? Do you know what that is, uh, Beatrice? No, lead. Lead, lead, it's like plumber. Originally the plumbers were, were lead workers. Unfortunately, um, they didn't know that lead is poisonous. And so, and I think I told you the story about, we used to have lead in paint. This is in the 60s, in 1960s. And um, if a little piece of paint came off the wall, a child might put it in its mouth and get lead, lead poisoning. So that's not good and it can, it can hurt the brain. So now there's no lead in paint. So you don't have to worry about that. There's no lead in paint. So, but anyways, Michael still shouldn't eat, eat the paint though, Beatrice, okay? <laughs> he still shouldn't eat the paint. That's not good for you. But you see, it used to have lead in it. So they have, what are the heavy metals? Mercury, silver, and lead, and they can damage and denature a protein. So these are the things. Heat and ultraviolet light, organic solvents. Solvent means something that can dissolve something else. Um, strong acids and bases, detergents and heavy metal ions can denature proteins, okay? All right, Samarwit. Which of the following indicates that a protein has been hydrolyzed? Loss of disulfide bonds, we, we haven't talked about that. Precipitation of the protein, loss of native structure or the presence of lone amino acids. In other words, amino acids that are separated, not combined. Which one? Number four. Number four, right. Very good. You see that, Beatrice? That's hydro hydrolysis, breaking apart into separate amino acids. Okay, that's what hydrolysis is, which, which I show with this diagram. They're connected and then they separate. And that happens in digestion, very important. And so amino acids are absorbed into the bloodstream and those amino acids go into the body. And again, amazing. And they're used to build all the proteins needed in the body. You know, we talked about those eight functions. So different proteins are built from those amino acids that, that you absorb. It's about 20 of them in, you know, that, that we need, that humans need, that, that we, we get in food and, pro, and uh, you know, there could be vegetables. Some vegetables have proteins and, and meats have proteins. And when, once they get in there, once they get absorbed, they're used to build all the different proteins in the body that are needed for the body to function. Amazing. Now, both of these refer to what? Precipitation of the protein and loss of native structure. Which process is that called? Denaturation. Exactly. Denaturation. So loss of protein structure loss of native structure, it doesn't function anymore. The native just means the original. You know, like, uh, like here, here in, in North America, you could talk about the native inhabitants, the inhabitants that were here already. And then the Europeans came. So the native 
inhabitants were the people here. Here, the native means the original state, the original state of the, of the protein. It loses that structure and precipitate means that it forms a insoluble solid. It won't dissolve in water anymore and floats to the top of the water. Okay, Beatrice, when a protein is exposed to a detergent or heavy metal, it is likely to be blank rather than blank. So is it one, two, three, or four? It's three. No. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'm so, I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. You're right. Excuse me. Absent minor professor. You, you can spank me now, uh, Beatrice, because I, I, I was wrong. You, you're exactly right. Denatured and hydrolyzed. So you need to know the difference between the two of those, okay? Okay. And again, just to emphasize the, um, this diagram again, which you don't need to know. You don't need to know this diagram. Just an example. Okay. Now, here's what I did. And I also have this posted um, in D2L with, with the PowerPoint slides for, under, under the PowerPoint slides for Chapter 19. And I also, I think I'll send this to you as an email attachment, just a Word document. So we, these are all the terms you need to know the meaning of, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to be able to label that chart. For the exam? Yeah, you need to know what, what all these terms mean. Right. Okay, so there's a lot of memory work in this chapter. And as I say, this chapter really is more like a, uh, a biology course, because now you're looking at names and, names and functions, meanings of, of, the, of the different things. And if you can, if you have any question about any of this, um, please, you know, please let me know. Please contact me. But again, you should be able to know the meaning of each of these guys, okay? And this will be helpful for you in, in, in your future courses and your, in your future career. Okay, now what I want to do is re recap, recap the course, the whole course, because this is the last day. You know, Shakespeare once said in one of his plays, parting is such sweet sorrow. So I really am going to miss both of you. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And I know it's been hard for you, but you've, you've been good. You've, you've worked at it, and it's, uh, we're almost done. And then you can really relax when you're done after Monday. Okay, so in chemistry, we're studying one aspect of God's creation. It's the fundamental makeup of all material things, living and non-living in the universe. Remember, we said those elements, those... 119 elements, actually it's, some of those are synthetic, but basically about 100 elements make up everything in the universe. The moon rocks, the sun, all the same elements. So in chemistry, we study the stuff that makes things up. The early, the ancient Greeks guessed, and they were right, that things are made up of atoms. And I'm proud to tell you this, you know more about this than all the people who have ever lived since the beginning of time up until the 1900s. Mm -hmm. Most of these discoveries have come in the last 400 years. And any of those scientists would be so happy to be in your place to learn all the things that, that you learned in this course. But you know more than all the people who have ever lived. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> now, remember I showed you this chart. Don't, don't show this to your other professors. They might get mad. <laughs> and the only reason why we say that chemistry is central is because it's the stuff that makes up everything. It's the stuff that makes up everything. That's why we say it's central because all the other sciences depend on the stuff. Okay. Okay. So. We looked at chapter one, matter, measurements, and calculations. Remember, we looked at what matter is made of, the property. We have looked at solutions and diatomic, triatomic, mono, uh, you know, atoms, molecules, and so on. Calculations. Yeah. Chapter two, looking at the atoms and molecules and what the atoms are made up of and how they join together to form molecules. Chapter three, complicated, the electronic structure. 
And remember I said it's, the electrons are like a crown of stars around every atom. And they're beautifully arranged and they're all in order. As you go across the periodic table, each atom has one more electron and one more proton. And there's no missing spaces. It's kind of interesting. I, I, I get a kick, I, I, I'm amazed by that. There's no missing spaces. There's always another atom that has one more proton and one more electron until you get to the end. And so we talked about the periodic table, which is an amazing work of genius to line everything up and to show how everything's organized. So you can see that there was an intelligence behind all of this. And it's quite, quite amazing. And we're still learning things. And in chapter four, we talked about the forces between the particles. First of all, within, an, within, an, within a molecule, you have bonds. Remember you, have, you can have a, um, a, uh, a non-polar covalent or a polar covalent, or you can have an ionic bond. And then between particle, between molecules, you can have you know, hydrogen bonds or dispersion forces or dipolar forces. So the forces between, between molecules. Chapter 11, it was the study of organic compounds. What's an organic compound, Beatrice? What, what does it contain? Which element? Carbon and hydrogen. Carbon, carbon. Well, carbon, it also contains hydrogen too, but it's carbon is the key thing. And uh, remember the alkanes are the ones with single bonds. If you ever take a full course in organic chemistry, which you may have to, at some point, you'll learn about the double, double bonds are alkenes and the triple bonds are alkynes. And we also looked at the, the cycloalkanes. And, and now we just saw that some of the steroid hormones are made up of these cycloalkanes, pretty cool. And, um, and there's functional groups like alcohol and esters, that, you know, things, things that were on the last exam. Um, ketones. And initially they thought organic compounds only came from what? Only came from living things. Something like, like urea, for example, only came from living things. But then they were able to actually synthesize urea in the laboratory. So they had to come up with a new definition. They're basically saying anything that contains carbon is considered an organic, organic compound. And then finally, we get closer to humans, the proteins that make up the human body, also other, other living things. We looked at all the different functions uh, of proteins, the shapes, whether they're, they're, how they're classified. They could be simple with just amino acids, or they could be conjugated with something else attached called a prosthetic group. And to break down a proton, protein, you can use hydrolysis to separate or to damage the function, you can use denaturization. The primary structure of a protein is the sequence or order in which the amino acids are attached. Okay, now, hopefully this won't happen, but if you forget everything that you learned in this course, <laughs> This is something I never want you to forget, and I don't think you will. It's a take home point number one to appreciate the order and the harmony in the material world. It's like a symphony, everything works together. Like, if you, if you think of it like a concert, you have all the different instruments playing together and they produce beautiful music, right? It's a symphony, and that's the way it is in nature. All the different things work together beautifully, unless there's an illness and or, or unless there's evil, and that's another topic, but there is evil in the world, which is hard to understand. But anyway, that's another topic, but there is a beautiful order and harmony in, in the material wor world. So you should, you should, for the rest of your life, you, sh you should remember that and appreciate it as you look at things and have a sense of awe and wonder because it's awesome. And I love teaching it because it's like, to me, it's like looking at a beautiful painting to see how everything is, is so complicated and beautifully arranged and it's awesome. It's amazing. You know, and here we're just talking about material things, chemistry, but when you get to living things, it's much, much, much more amazing. I mean, the whole thing of how, you know, a little baby 
begins as one cell. The sperm and the egg join and you get one little cell and all of a sudden it starts growing and all the different parts of the body start being made. And next thing you know, the heart's beating and the head starts, all the different parts, and, it all, and, and you end up with a baby. It's amazing. It's too, you know, I can remember the time that I, you know, it was an embryology lab, and they let us look at a, uh, the formation of a chick embryo. So we, um, we fertilize a chick, you know, the sperm and egg, and put it on a, on a slide. And after like 24 hours, you could, or 48 hours, you, you look under the microscope, you can see the heart beating. You see the heart beating, amazing. So it's mm -hmm. it's awesome. It's so awesome. Um, so always keep that sense of wonder. And then, unfortunately, we had to learn the language of chemistry. Not not always so easy. In the language of biochemistry now for this chapter, not always so easy. But it's important because, as I said, if someone from Sudan wanted to speak to someone in Nigeria, well, they they need to know the that they're talking about the same thing. So the chemists had to get together and say, okay, boys and girls, we got to come up with a way to name these things that everyone knows what we're talking about. Some of the early names were, you know, were already being used. So we have the older names, you know, because over time, you know, we, uh, by the way, it took a long, long, long time to discover all the elements. One of the reasons is because the elements, except with a few exceptions, like the noble gases, they're always combined with other atoms. They're always combined with other, other elements and they're not solo. So it took centuries and centuries, thousands of years really, to discover all the elements. And most of them were discovered in the, in the 1800s and 1900s because we only had a handful that we knew about before then. And, um, and so the guy who discovered the element generally got to name it. But now if you discover a new element, then you have to go through the committee but sometimes there's fighting as to what are we going to name this? And anyway, so the chemists set up a, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, and they agreed on a way to name things. And of course, organic chemistry can be a little bit tricky. Remember, you have to name things alphabetically and with the lowest numbers and that kind of thing. And so if you publish a scientific paper, everyone, everyone will know what you're talking about. So now you can say, I know another language, chemistry. I can speak Spanish, I can speak English, and now I also know the language of chemistry, so that's pretty good. And then this is not something to be overlooked. We, we did talk about some study skills and test-taking skills. Remember I said when you're taking an exam, do the easiest questions first, come back to the more difficult ones, you know, put a little dash next to the one. Don't, don't, don't get stuck on a question and spend 15 minutes on one question. No, no put a dash next to it, come back to it. And actually sometimes your brain keeps working on it even though you don't know it. And sometimes you come back later and you see what the answer, how to, how to do it. In multiple choice questions, think of the answer first before you look at the choices. And I, I did give one exception in this chapter, but, uh, or last chapter, but um, you should always double check your answers. Your first answer is usually the correct one. So you should never change it unless you have a good reason. And I've seen so many students who had the right answer and then they changed it to the wrong answer, okay? And of course, don't leave anything blank. You should guess, you know, with the Google Forms, you can't leave it blank because it, it won't let you submit it. But I've had students who hand in exams and they just, multiple choice, they just leave it blank. We might as well guess. And if you guess, just use the same letter for all the guesses, you might, you might get some of them right. And then here's the thing about when you're studying, always to use all your, as many senses as you can. So when you read it, you're basically seeing it, speak it out loud, you're hearing it and, you're, and write it. Using all these senses will help you to remember things. So maybe for all these terms you need to learn in this chapter to do, to do this, write them out, speak them, um, sing them, <laughs> sing them. Uh, I, I've known people that have done that. They make up a song of the different things they, they need to learn. But um, and nowadays, you know, people are always talking to themselves. So what the heck? I mean, it looks like they're talking to themselves. They're walking down the street. They have their earphones on and you can't see them. It looks like they're talking to themselves. They're actually talking to somebody on the phone. But anyway, so don't worry about if somebody sees you talking out loud because it's okay. But it does help you to remember it if you speak it out loud sometimes. That helps you. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask, I'm going to give each of you a turn. So we, we finished this course. 
And um, if somebody said to you, what did you learn in that course? Could you, could you tell me one thing, Sam, or what, that you learned in the course? I learned a lot of things. Um, just, just tell me one thing. The, the, the first chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, because I learned it when I was grade seven or uh, eight. So totally I forget it. But now I remember a lot of stuff. So I learned a lot of things from chapter one. Okay. And all chapter actually. Okay. What about you, Beatrice? Can you name one something you learned in the court? Just one thing you learned? Uh, I would say I have learned a lot in this class since the beginning till this moment because I don't really know much about chemistry initially and I was so scared when we want to start it, when we, before we started this class I was thinking that maybe it's kind of thing that I will not be able to do but I thank God and I thank you also for giving me confidence in the beginning I said okay let me try if it's something I cannot do maybe I will drop or when we get to the middle stage, I, I realize that it's something that I can continue with. Right. So I must say I've learned a lot from the first topic to the end, especially concerning the protein part that we just we just talked about today. I really gained a lot in it because I don't really know much how important it is. But now you made me know that it is very, very important. It has its own purpose that is normally serving human body. And I've nearly thought in the beginning when we started the matter and calculation thing. So it's good. interesting. I really enjoyed the class. Well, that's good. And the thing is, you know, you know, God is God is good. And, you know, he put you in a class now with just two of you. So that way I could work with you. Because normally you, you might be in a bigger class and the professor wouldn't be able to give you so much attention. And it is hard. You know, this is one of the harder courses. So I'm glad that you, that you got it over with, you know. I mean, just have the one more exam, but, you know, and, um, you know, you, I'm very proud of both of you because it is a hard course and students have difficulty with it. And uh, hopefully, so it's good, it'll good to have this out of the way now. And I'm glad that you didn't give up, Beatrice, you know, because some students do. And it's, I'm glad you didn't. And you, you hung in there. So that's a good, that's a good thing. All right. And I wanted to, again, to say that if you ever need a reference, please contact me. There's my email address. And, um, you know, I, I do lots and lots of recommendations because I get to know the students very well. And so I, and I, every recommendation is I make it unique. And I talk about your strong points. Um, each of you have strong points. And of course, when I, when I write one for you, Beatrice, I'm going to say, Beatrice was working full time and she had three children and she took the course. And I'm, that's very impressive. That is impressive. And mm -hmm. Samrawit, you know, you've been, you've done very well. You've come from a different country, Sudan. You're living by yourself and you, you took five. You how many courses did you take this summer? Um, four. She took four courses. That's impressive. So I could put that in the recommendation. She took four different courses and did very well in the chemistry. And then don't forget now, because if you're both heading, are you both heading to be nurses? Is that, is that what your goal is? Yes. So if I'm ever your patient, please take good care of me. You know, I, I'm, I'll be counting on you. Never know. You never know. I will. <laughs> you know, one of my one of my students uh, is now a doctor. You know, I've never I haven't been his patient, but he's a doctor now. So you never know. So please take care of me if I'm your patient. I will. Professor. And then I have something very nice to, which I'm going to send you. I'll, I'll print it off and send it to you. But I wanted to tell both of you, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the fellowship of those educated in the wonders of the chemical world. <laughs> Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank All righty. So well, those are my remarks. Um, did you, um, let me just, did you have any other questions, let's say about chapter chapter 11 on the, on the proteins? You, you, you pretty much know what you need to study now. For chapter 19? For chapter 19. I think, you, you know, I, I went over the major things you need to study. Peptide bonds and how the amino acids join together, the N-terminal, the C-terminal, um, the carboxylate group, the amino group, the alpha carbon, and, and the, the different functions of all those proteins, the names. 
and things we talked about today. The the terms you showed the other time that you, we need to know is that the one you yes. are talking Yes. Okay. Yes. But do, as do always, we have it in the PowerPoints, Professor. Yes, and also I'm gonna. It's if you go to um, the D2L and you look under where the PowerPoint slides are, I have I have uh, the Word document that has those terms. But I'll I'll also send it to you as a Word attachment in the email. So you should know all those terms and, and as always know everything in the PowerPoint slides. Because okay. I can't guarantee that I got everything on that sheet, but I try to get most of the things, but know everything in the PowerPoint slides. And this one again is gonna be more, you know, information. You don't really need to figure out anything. Um, you just need to know how the amino acids are attached together, the different parts and, um, but nothing, there's no calculations or, the name, there's no nothing naming in organic chemistry. Naming things can be difficult. There, there's none of that. So it's just more the inf more information this time. I have well, a question. Please, please. For the final exam, is it going to be from the chapter we did no, no, from no. the beginning? No, no, no. The exam. Only chapter eleven. Only chapter eleven. Okay. Only chapter eleven. Good question. Only chapter eleven. Only chapter nineteen. Uh, okay. 19, 19, Scott, I'm sorry, absent minor professor, proteins, chapter 19, mm -hmm. sorry, thank you, sorry about that, because, you know, professors, did you ever hear the story about Einstein, he was so smart that he was thinking about a problem, and he, he forgot how to go home, he couldn't remember how to go home, <laughs> so <laughs> professors can be absent-minded, so sorry about that, so, you know, proteins, chapter 19, well, I hate to say goodbye, let's make it a, uh, a see professor. you later, Go Before ahead. we say goodbye. Huh? Before we say goodbye, I want to use this opportunity to say big thank you to you for all you've done from the beginning of this class to the end. And I will thank you for giving me confidence. I must tell you the truth. <laughs> I was so scared in the beginning. But the way you undo the class, you let me know that I can do it. And I thank God that. I, I tried my best <laughs> with God help and with your help. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to yes. hear that. I'm happy to, I'm so, to finish. Yes. I'm so and happy. Thank you for always asking of my family, asking of my children, asking about them, Michelle, Miko. You always want to know how they are doing. And sometimes maybe if I don't log in on time, you always understand my situation that maybe because of family issue or something like that. It's not all professor that always understand that way. But thank you for always working with me. And thank mm -hmm. you for always being there for me. Thank you so much. Oh, well, you're very well. You're very, very welcome, Beatrice. And um, as I told you, I have some other friends from Nigeria. And you tell me you're, you're Yoruba, right? Yes. Because I know there's Yoruba and Igbo, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and then Sudan, you know, as I told you, um, Sam Awit, I in Washington, there are many, many, many Ethiopians. You know, I have many friends, nicest people in the world. So your parents are lucky to be there in Ethiopia. But let's pray for peace in Ethiopia. Let's pray for peace in Nigeria because of the, you know, the, you got the Boko Haram, you know, the Boko Haram, is that their name, Beatrice? They're, yes. They kidnap, they kidnap people. They do terrorism. It's terrible. And then we got to pray for the end of the pandemic. Um, so let's pray for the end of because now people, it's, people are still dying. You know, they're getting the COVID and they die because they're, they're not vaccinated. Some people don't want to be vaccinated and then they get the COVID and they die. So it's sad, you know. So we got to pray that this thing ends. All right. And, and pray that they come up with a good treatment, an antiviral drug to treat it. So, well, God bless both of you. And mm -hmm. I want to say, um, may God bless your families and protect you. And please stay in touch and let me know how you're doing, okay? Okay, thank okay you, well, you, this is Professor Coppola from the nation's capital signing off to two beautiful, wonderful students. Goodbye now. Bye, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.